This episode is made possible by the generosity of our listeners. Thank you. Welcome to the Creation Science For Kids show. Can you imagine what the world looked like before God started to shape it? There's a spot halfway through the Bible that gives us a glimpse of what it was like. And we can hardly wait to tell you about some creation ministries you'll want to check out and what kids can do to encourage people on the front lines who are speaking for the truth. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Psalm 111, verses 1 through 4. This is episode 78 of the podcast, where we learn about Jesus, our Creator, and his amazing world. Hi, I'm Sherry Fields, your host, and I'm joined today by my co host, Samuel. Hi. And Stephen. Hi. To follow along with what we're looking at, check out the show notes, creation science, the number for kids.com slash coloring or 078. And be sure to listen to the end for the punny joke of the day. Okay, we're continuing to work through Proverbs chapter eight, which has long been one of my favorites. And this is perhaps one of the most amazing sections to get your imagination going. Here we're going to look at Proverbs 8, verses 24 through 26. Would you read them for us, please, Stephen? When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Well, as yet he had not made the earth, nor the field, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, so do you remember what the I is? Who who or what is that? God? No. Do you remember? Um, Adam? It was wisdom. Now, that's one of the things here. Wisdom is referred to as a she. But we know, first of all, in English, we've lost it. If you speak to somebody who speaks another language, you'll find out that all kinds of things, tables and noses and and cars are he or she, which is crazy to us, but we've lost it. So wisdom in Hebrew is feminine. But we also understand that wisdom can refer to Jesus. So there are several things here that we see. When did God start using wisdom? to create. Before there was what? Depths. Depths. And the next is? Fountains. Yeah. So what are depths and fountains? Do you know what kinds of things or what kind of substance is that referring to? Do you know? No. A fountain. What is a fountain full of? Water. Water. And depths is a word that is used to talk about the ocean. So now it gives you a picture. Before there were oceans... Before there were fountains abounding with water. If you think about the earth, when God first started making it, or before he started, he hadn't even made the ocean. So that means before there in um, Genesis 1-2, where it talks about the Spirit of God moving on the face of the water. Now, the fountains abounding with water is one of the coolest things about creation science. For there to be a fountain, a natural one, where is the water before it comes spurting out? Is it to the ocean? What does the ocean have fountains? No. No. Where would? How would you have a natural fountain? We do have some now. What What do we call natural fountains in the earth? Um, springs. Springs. Yes. So before it comes out of the springs, where is it? Under the ground. Underground. Yes. So that tells us straight out, and this isn't the only place that there was water at the beginning underground. 
Now, if you want to do some more research, there is a very fascinating theory developed by a scientist called Dr. Walt Brown, and actually he has his own bulldog, just like、um, Darwin. He didn't do that much to make evolution very, very popular. He had somebody who did it for him, Huxley, and he was called Darwin's bulldog because he made sure everybody knew about the theory and pushed them to say, "Hey, this is true." So, Dr. Brown has his own. Pastor Bob Enyart, that I mentioned with time a couple podcasts ago, and you can find out more about his theories called the hydroplate theory, which is the idea that when God first made the dry land, it was floating on a huge amount of underground water that came spewing out during the flood, splashed all over and sprayed everywhere. That's how you would get all the fossils. And there are a lot of very wise and very probable things about that theory. So I'll leave more about that. Then, what's the next thing after it talks about oceans and underground fountains? What's the next thing that wisdom was already there before these were created? Mountains. Uh huh. And hills. Hills. Yeah. What are mountains and hills? <laughs> Big lumps of dirt, rocks, and grass, and other plants. Yeah, tiny skin of grass, but it's mostly rock. Yeah. When did God make the first mountains? Now we don't have the same ones now. On top of our highest mountains, except for volcanoes, we find、um, sea fossils. So we know before the flood they were down low. But there were mountains and hills when God first created the world. When did He make hills and things? Which day of creation week? The third, yes, on the third, and right away that very day he covered in grass, like you mentioned. He made the mountains on day three. So now we've moved up a couple of days, but not very long. And then it continues on. Well, he had not made the earth nor the fields, so that's continuing on with day three. Now this is really cool. Nor the highest part of the dust of the world. What does that make you picture? Um. Well. Do you know what dust is? It's some、um, stuff that floats up in the air. Right.、Mm-hmm. It's basically skin that people <laughs> all shed. Well, that's true in our houses, but in this case, it would not. So there are two possibilities: what this highest part of the dust of the world could be. Today, wind conditions are just right, usually across the Sahara Desert,、um, and there are a couple other places on Earth where there are deserts. We have. Dust in the high parts of our atmosphere. So what happens today is you've got sand flies, sand flies up and makes dust. Yes, and how would it fly up? What did it would it take to get the sand and bits to leave the ground? The wind. The wind. So what you need is a place that's very dry, very windy, and from what I research, is you also need it to have kind of. A bowl where it's down low for some reason that it kind of helps it swirl way up high. So yeah, we have quite a bit of African dust settles every year in North America, and there are a couple other places where you get particles from far away, and you can tell because it's got different mineral makeup that doesn't fit the local area. So that's one possibility that he could have made dust floating on the world, but that's a little odd for when God first created. Were there deserts right away? No. No, we know that the whole world was watered by that mist rising up, so there wouldn't have been a Sahara Desert. In fact, there wasn't a Sahara Desert right away after the Ark landed because we have drawings of people who used to live in the Sahara, and from what how they pictured it, is it looked a lot more like where the giraffes and zebras live now than like the sand dunes that it is today. So that's not as likely. But what else could the dust be? So I decided to look around, and I use searchcreation.org to do some of my research. What's interesting is that word "dust." It is normally used like we think of tiny particles of dirt, but there are a couple of places that show that it can mean more than that. In Job twenty-eight two, Job is talking, and he says, "Iron is taken out of the earth," and that's the same word. And brass is molten out of the stone. So, when you get iron, can you just take a lump of it out of the ground and turn it into a sword or、no. fork? What do you have to do? You、It's、have to, to smelt, smelt it, it, right? And you put it But in the and- do you get a whole chunk of iron, and that's all it is? No. No, it's in something called iron ore. Oh yeah, iron ore. 
So that earth, that word dust, can also mean or. And then in Isaiah two nineteen, it says, "And they, the bad guys, shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth." Same word. So it's a cave, and the stuff that the cave is surrounded by is that word. So it can mean just the basic parts that the world is made out of. Did they have a table of elements back when they wrote the Bible? No. No, they didn't. And King Solomon, very wise as he was, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, would not have been given an English word or a modern word that we use today for elements. But he could well have meant it. So, Stephen, you have a cool book from Basher about the elements. Can you remember any of them? Yeah.、Mm-hmm. Hydrogen. Uh huh. Lithium. Uh huh. Helium. Carbon. Yeah. All right. So if you've got all kinds, silver and gold and einsteinium <laughs> and europium. All right, that's good. Okay, so if you're going to have the highest parts of the dust of the earth, it could mean just your most basic elements. The People who want to say that everything created itself will say that the Big Bang would have only created very light molecules like hydrogen and helium, and then it would have taken stars going supernova and stuff to create the heavier, denser things like iron and beryllium and stuff. But it could easily mean when you're thinking of three thousand year old words of people who hadn't had no idea about the table of elements, that could be what God was trying to say that. Right at the beginning, when he was coming up with what he would make the whole universe out of, that wisdom was there. That's what he was, how he was thinking, what he was using to say, "Hmm, how shall we do this?" And would that make sense with Jesus saying, "How shall we put this earth together so it stays strong and does what we need it to?" Would he have come up with the elements? Uh huh. Yeah. Would he have settled the mountains? Yep, and come up with oceans and ways to have underground water that could be used for all kinds of things, good and bad. Uh huh. Absolutely. Now, I wanted to share about a couple of ministries, and in fact, that's what we're going to do a bit more of a mashup than we usually do. So first. I just found out last week about a brand new podcast for you big people because it has some really big ideas, but is I've found very helpful. It's called the Bible Q and A podcast with an ampersand, and it's being hosted by Eric Hovind. You know him. What's he from? Creation Today. And is he fun to listen to? Uh huh. Very fun. And Tim Chafee. Do you remember meeting him? He was the one that showed us around the Answers in Genesis studio where they were making the models and things. He was our host. Do you remember? Yeah, he's a very kind man and very tall. Yeah, so he's the one who does most of the Bible talk, and Eric Hoven will ask him questions and bounce back and forth. But they aren't. Shying away from big issues, and I am very pleased with what they're doing, and really enjoy listening. They make a great team to listen to. So I'll have a link to their iTunes and add it. Also, I have a page where I list every creation podcast that I run into, and so that's creation science number four kids dot com slash creation dash podcasts. So. They'll be on there right near the top because it's one of my favorites already, and I just hope that they keep doing this for years and years and years. And they could use a rating and review because, as far as I could tell, I gave them their first one, and they need lots more. And then there's another ministry that's become really big in our lives. What is that, or who is doing that ministry? David Reeves. Yes. David Reeves Ministries has been around for quite a while. He was quite young starting it because, as far as I know, he's still in his twenties. But they have asked me to take on the role of curating a subset of David Reeves Ministries, which is called the Creation Club, which is a kind of community forum magazine blog 
that anybody in creation science can write for. And I'm in charge of editing, scheduling, doing their Facebook and all that stuff. It's a lot of fun. And in fact, I am always looking for young people who want to just share what they find interesting. They don't cover animals hardly at all. So if you want to write about an animal or something, your favorite thing to learn about creation science, write to me. It has a contact page there, or you can contact me on cs4ks.com, and I'll get you plugged right in. And there's one more thing I do for him. I help write the scripts for a little show he has called The Heavens Declare. And he finally, he and his team finally put together the first video. And what was it about? The blue sky. Yes. Why is the sky blue? And that is one I had written up an article for my own website several years ago and was just fascinated. So that was that was the first one I decided to take on since I knew a lot about it. And I'm so excited with how they did it. In fact, I will embed that video in the show notes so you can watch it right there. Do you remember anything cool about the blue sky? Whenever you see the blue sky, mm-hmm. sometimes you can actually see the cells in your eyes. Right. I thought what they did with the graphics was awesome. The only thing is as they're showing the individual cells that do run through the retinas, In front of where your um, vision is, it showed a line of red cells and then a whole line of white cells. That's not true, the whole line of white cells. You would have one white cell and then more red cells. And it's that one white cell that lets the blue light through, and that's the bright spot you see. So anyway, that's super cool. I am so grateful to David Reeves, his family and their ministries. I think they're doing awesome work. That's the only reason I agreed to work for them is I already liked what they're doing. So come over to the show notes, see the video, check out their website. I'll have a link and then contact me when you're ready to write an essay for a science report. If you'd rather do that, then send me some audio. It is easier to type than it is to record if you're not used to it. Let me know. It'd be awesome to get you plugged in. Now, for your report, Samuel, I decided to do something that I've talked about people doing for over a year. Way back when I had first been contacted by Hillary Greenwald, and she let me share her amazing drawings, uh, printable drawing of an arc that I could share as a coloring page, I had mentioned that, hey, you could color this picture and send it to Ken Ham to thank you. So what did we do? We colored the Noah's Ark coloring page. Uh-huh. And then what did we do with him? We sent him to Ken Ham. We sure did. So Samuel did the fanciest one, which I think is the most beautiful, where it has the verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Isn't that what the verse Mm -hmm. Okay, Samuel did that, Stephen did another one, and Hope colored one, and we mailed it off. I also sent him some of my music. If you want to check out the hymn tunes that I've redone to traditional hymns, I'll have a link in the show notes to that. So I included one of my CDs to tell Ken Ham thank you, and I also sent him a copy of my article on Did Adam Have a Belly Button? Because I thought he would get a kick out of it, and I had mentioned him rather a lot and nicely. So anyway, we decided to go ahead and send him a kind of care package. Now, why would it be something that would be good to tell a person like Ken Ham or Eric Hoven or or somebody, the team at ICR or um, Creation Ministries International, why would it be a good thing to send them a care package to say thank you? Because they helped us. They sure have. And without, especially teams like ICR, and all of them have scientists working for them, there would be very little information we would have to work with to tell other people. So they have blessed us a lot. And what do they hear most of the time? Can you guess what they probably hear when they're out online or reading the paper? What would most of the people be talking, saying about what they do? That it's awesome. Mm, Some. When they go to churches, I'm sure they hear that. And that's wonderful. But what about what they read on the internet or see in newspapers? Do people out in the world like what they're doing? 
No. No, they don't. And there are a lot of people, and they can say some horribly mean things and lie about them and say, like one of the things that I hear the most often, and if they pull it on Facebook, I ban them instantly, but that it's actually child abuse to teach a child about creation, that Jesus made them and that they didn't evolve from monkeys, which is, of course, utterly ridiculous. But that's the kind of thing we hear. In fact, even me, I hear probably at least as often from somebody who hates what I do as I do from somebody who really encourages me. And it really does make me happy whenever somebody messages me on Facebook. So these kind of people really would appreciate it. And what else? When you look at Ken Ham's picture, what does it remind you of? He looks like a grandpa. That's right. Any grandpa loves to see colored pictures, especially for them. And so do young people like Eric Coven and David Reeves. It really does make people's day. And it's something that children can do the best of all. And it didn't cost very much. It was easily doable. And we sent ours off in time for Ken Ham to get it just before Thanksgiving, which I thought was particularly appropriate. Now, for your report, Samuel, we did arcs that, except for Stevens, looked like the Ark Encounter, which is not just a box. Do you remember why Answers in Genesis did not make their arc look like a long rectangle? Because if they made it a long rectangle, mm-hmm. it would flip over. Not exactly. We did study, why did God tell Noah to make the ark as long and as high and as tall? And what did we see? It showed if you had a really skinny long ark or a really fat wide ark that it would be better at some things. But what was special about the shape of the ark that God told Noah? That picture where it showed the skinny ark and the tall ark and the Mm -hmm. wide ark? Yeah. Hmm. So the skinny arc would make it so you wouldn't get seasick, right. but you just flip over. Flip sideways, yes. Okay. And the wide arc would... Make you go up. Right, wow. yeah. So every time you went over a wave, you wouldn't tip over, but you would be horribly seasick. So the way God told Noah to build the ark gave you a good balance for carrying cargo without getting too sick and not tipping over. And what about those odd shapes? Like it has that kind of low nose in the front and that fin at the back. Why did Answers in Genesis decide to do that rather than have a, just a rectangle? Because the top one makes it turn the way mm-hmm. that the wind's going, and the bottom one needs for the waves to get split. Right. So, like a weather vane, points the direction the wind is blowing because the wind always pushes it until it gets to the skinniest point. And that's what that fin would do, is turn the ship constantly into the wind and then that front. And why, how did they guess that that front prow would be something that would fit the arc, that it wasn't just imagination? Where did they get that idea from? From other ancient boat. Right. When we look at the most ancient ships, they were much better designed than it had gotten like the time of Christopher Columbus. Those were leaky little tubs. But the ancient ships that we find from well before the time of Jesus were well designed and had things like that front prow. Um, There was also something about the way the wood was that would help it in case a giant tree was ripped up and smashed into the side of the ark. Do you remember? Was it just one big log covering the outside? No. It was a bunch of them. Yeah, like a whole bunch of layers. And they showed a cross section with like five. And that's also based on ancient historical boats. So they did a lot of thinking. How could you have the ark be flexible and be able to survive rather than requiring God to just rescue them with a miracle? And what about why not a rectangle? Do you remember it said, well... If you're giving the size of this, you could get the idea of a rectangle. Do you remember? A Corvette. Yeah. And what is a Corvette? A car. And why choose a Corvette rather than, um, I don't know, a Cadillac DeVille? A Corvette is what shape? Is it a rectangle? 
Mm-mm. No, it has no straight lines hardly anywhere. It's all curvy and sloped up and down. But still, if you were giving how tall it is, how wide it is, how deep it is, you would get a rectangle shape if you just had those dimensions. And yet we know that would give you a very false picture if that's all you went with. So the Bible tells us some information so that Noah would have made the ark the right ratio, but it does not mean it must be a rectangle, bottom, top, sides. So that's why Answers in Genesis ark looks so different from other drawings of the ark. Can we know if the ark encounter is shaped exactly like Noah's ark? No. No. But they did a good guess, and the Bible leaves us plenty of room for imagination. There have been hundreds of novels written about Bible characters because the Bible only tells us enough to believe. It doesn't tell us everything. And when they went to build the Ark Encounter, they had to pick some shape, so they did the work. And do you remember how long ago they had studied what would work best for a ship so that it would be comfortable sailing? Did they do it? right when it was time to build the ark? Not two years ago. It was over 10 years before. I think it was in 2007. So almost 10 almost ten years before they actually built it that they did the study. And I will link to the pages where they talk about it and how Noah's Ark is so well built. Do you remember that room in the Ark Encounter where it talked about other flood legends and the shape of those arks? Yeah. Yeah. It was one of our favorites. Why? What happened to the all, all the other shapes? They sink. Right. If you actually made a ship, those shapes, it would either kill everybody inside, like the um, in Gilgamesh's story from the Babylonians, it was a cube, so the ship didn't actually sink, but everybody inside got shaken to death, and most of the rest all sank. But the way God tells us in the Bible actually works because is the bible just a legend no it's true it actually happened yeah in fact to close i recently heard ben shetler who he came to our church he had co-hosted with eric hoven on the creation today show a few years back and he was talking about going to new york city and talking to a guy who'd never heard anything about jesus in the bible so he's talking and saying okay if there is a god who created everything How would he let people know what he wanted them to know so that it would be work across all cultures and for a long, long time, not just for a few people for a short time? The guy said, you know, I think he'd write a book. And then he kept talking to him. And basically everything he said, God did do. He really did write a book. He really did send Jesus. And we can know the truth. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Don't forget, you can find all the links to all the things we've talked about today by visiting the show notes page. Creation Science the number four kids dot com slash coloring. To let your friends know about this podcast and ministry. And to connect with all the rest of the things we do with the podcast, stop by the web address I got just for you cs4ks.com and find out how to send us your own recording, write us a Apple podcast review, drop us a note, become a monthly supporter, and see the heart of why this ministry is so important. Oh, by the way, if you or a friend uses Spotify rather than Apple Podcasts or something like that, let them know that this show is available in Spotify. So if getting plugged into something new is too much work, they don't have to. Has this show been a blessing to your family? Running this podcast and ministry isn't free. Plus, it takes a lot of time. We now have a Patreon account where you can help us out, like Pastor Brian Bedworth and the Academy of Christian Apologetics for Moms. Thank you. If just a few of our listeners help, even with just a dollar a month, it will help cover the rest of our basic expenses and anything above that will help us improve things for the future. Visit cs4ks.com to find out how you can get involved. Now for an ark joke. What kind of lighting did Noah have on the ark? I don't know. Floodlights. You can laugh out loud. It's a podcast. (laughs) Well, this finishes up our show for today. 
Until next time, have fun treasuring our amazing universe and creator. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Revelation 4.11 